be the dream machine. Diacom, H-07, I-H-E in the snap. We're building the future, never looking back. How is FHIR transforming the way that healthcare enterprises exchange data? Well, today we're joined with Alex Goel, founder of Topology, to explore this very topic. Alex brings with him extensive experience working with healthcare standards such as FHIR, HL7, and DICOM. His career includes roles at Ontario Health in the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services and as a digital health consultant. He's tackled projects ranging from modernizing cancer registry reporting to advancing global immunization guidelines. In this conversation, Alex breaks down the evolution of FHIR and its role in modern healthcare workflows. So with all that said, let's jump into the discussion. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining, uh, Alex. And uh, today we'll just jump right into it. Um, I, I wanted to, we're gonna have a conversation about FHIR. And um, I did a bit of sleuthing and I looked at, uh, Topology has been around since 2021. However, I know that you have been involved in FHIR far before that. And so maybe just to set the table, can you share with us a bit of your experience with getting into FHIR? Um, what, you're, you know, what year are we talking? Because I think FHIR was around 2014 that this establishes an emerging standard. So where were you entering the space? Yeah, so I started working on FHIR uh, in 2016 when we were still on DSTU2, Developing Standard for Trial Use 2. Um, and yeah, since then, we've now made it to R5, although R4, release 4, is the main version that's out there in the world. Um, and, you know, now they're working on release 6 of Fire, so things have been really rapidly evolving, but I've been involved in the community and, and working on the standard for, for quite a while. Interesting. Uh, so I'm curious what you've seen as far as... I always find when a new standard comes out or a new way of, um, a new framework of understanding, it takes a while for the clients to kind of catch up to where we're at. Um, and then this word fire would get, you know, bombarded at them. And I found a lot of people misunderstanding about it, like what its place in the workflow was or where it fit in. And have you seen that? I, I guess maybe, did you experience the same thing where you had kind of um, sometimes people coming in with expectations that were not aligned with what could happen. And have you seen an improvement in understanding on that from the client side? Yeah. So I, I actually want to take this question in a very different direction, Jason, because I find with people who have been working in healthcare for a long time, uh, when they see fire or when they saw fire for the first time, it was very surprising because it's so different from what we had in terms of uh, clinical document architecture or HL7 version two for those kinds of use cases. Mm -hmm. And, and fire technically speaking covers both of the use cases of those existing HL7 standards, both CDA and HL7 version two. Um, it's not in production for all of those use cases. It certainly can't cover every single domain yet, in my opinion, across all those use cases. Uh, but it's certainly getting there, and it's it's definitely got a pretty broad adoption already, looking at some specific domains. Um, now, the twist on this question that I want to take is that if you come from any other industry, fire looks very normal to you, very likely. Maybe a little weird because there's a ton of different data types. There's a lot of, you know, healthcare-specific things in fire, but when you compare it to APIs, uh, across the modern web, it is way more similar to that. So if you pluck a student out of, you know, a modern computer science course, they're going to look at fire and be like, oh, this kind of looks familiar. Like I know what JSON is and I know what these data types are and I know how to manipulate this in my code and things like that. And that was the kind of experience that I had with fire where I was like, oh, this looks very normal. What is this pipe delimited nonsense that we've got over here? Yes. With V2, so you right? didn't come from the HL7 V2 background yourself. No, that was really, by that, 2016 was really my first drop into healthcare. And now I have a way better understanding about why we have V2 and why V2 is stuck around for so long, because it is so robust and there hadn't been really anything better for a very long time. And there's a lot of difficulty in changing, changing the industry. But 
my experience was definitely like that where coming in in 2016 i was like what is why are we still using this pipe delimited format and it you know I'm learning in the industry it, it made more sense of course i remember um chatting with mahanad hussein uh, a fellow friend and he was saying the same thing that he didn't have hl7 v2 experience and kind of um <laughs> looked at it with a little disdain perhaps but yeah, just being able to, if you know JSON, um, you, you know, it's just it's just pretty much straightforward web services and yeah. understanding the resources at that point. Um, and so I'm curious as far as with that understanding that you've seen it evolve and, and maybe the, there's a better appreciation of where it fits in, what have you seen as far as the evolution of what you're being asked for? Um, is it is it pretty much cut and paste and... What you were being asked for in 2021 is the same type of workflow scenarios or integrations that you're doing, or ha are they changing? Are they advancing with what the standard is capable of? Yeah, I would say there's been a huge change, uh, even looking from 2022 to 2024, um, as, especially with the emergence of LLMs and the kind of use cases uh, that those tools are able to support. There's a way greater need for higher quality data um, and more accessible and web ready and queryable data, which Fire is better at. I think, um, you know, a lot of people would probably not disagree with me. Uh, a lot of people would not disagree and say that Fire is better for querying. It is so much easier to query data using Fire. And these LLMs and tools built around these LLMs like AI scribe platforms, like clinical note summarization platforms, like AI tools that are being built into a lot of radiology workflows benefit from being able to query for data. Um, and I think getting to that sort of modern query-driven RESTful architecture uh, in the healthcare space will enable us to, to really take advantage of these tools in, in ways that we haven't been able to in the past. Interesting. So I, I have another question kind of related to just awareness of how clients are coming up to speed on solutions and so on. I, I'm curious how often you come across folks that just they have an untapped availability of data that's at their fingertips that they could be leveraging for some really amazing <laughs> workflows and they just don't really understand, you know, maybe they've heard fire, but they don't understand what they could be really doing. Um, do you do you come across scenarios like that? Yeah, we come across that all the time. And I, th I think, unfortunately, in the way that Fire is deployed today, there's a very heavy reliance on on document. Um, and there's a lot of unstructured data and a lot of text data that's difficult to process, even with, uh, you know, the advancements that we've made in natural language processing, things like that. Still not 100% accurate and not the same as having high quality data. And, you know, I think people forget is that a lot of these tools do benefit from having high quality data and can be uh, improved or, uh, you know, deployed in very different and very useful ways when they are supported by high quality data. So I think that gap still exists um, in the industry as a whole, you know, regardless of what data standards we're talking about, is that there's just a lot of text data. And it, it absolutely makes sense why there is a lot of text data. Um, I think there's an overwhelming amount of it, but it does really impact the way that we think about deploying new systems, deploying new integrations. You touched on AI earlier, and yeah. um, obviously there's a, a significant need for structured data, um, at least historically, when going and, and you know setting up certain things to be resources and, and mappings and so on. And you want to make sure that what you're receiving is going to be consistent um, and it's radiology reports are notorious for just, you know, being verbose text. I, I'm curious where, what have you seen as far as AI, uh, fitting in for that and supplementing where we don't see good structure? Yeah. And I think there are some really good examples out there in the world now of, of being able to pull some structure out of these unstructured reports. Um, and one key use case that we hear a lot about is being able to summarize, uh, medical records. So that when you look at a patient's history as a physician, uh, you get a much shorter summary that, of information you need to read uh, or get sort of the key notes that you need, um, you know, which comes with some risks, of course. And that's why we want to make sure that we have high quality data and we have 
high levels of accuracy and we have good testing for these tools um, before we implement them widely. But this is the direction that uh, you know we're seeing a great need for the industry to move. So I, I try to keep these short and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with maybe the last question here. Um, in the imaging world, um, and this is going to be maybe a little bit more imaging specific, but, um, you know, we, we saw HL7 V2, and then there was, in, I think in 2005, there was HL7 V3, which um, was met with very low adoption, and not a lot of people took that on. And then Fire came out a little later on, about a decade later, and you had... Um, in all extents and purposes, it's considered HL7, you know, the version 4 or whatnot. Um, but often we think of these versions as being 2 replaces uh, 1, or, you know, 3 is going to replace 2. Um, and that's not always the case with Fire replacing, you know, HL7 V2. And where the, I, I want to take this question is, what have you seen as far as um, when approaching this? Like, where does HL7 V2 fit in as a backbone for the data that's being accessed or, um, and, and just to supplement these types of workflows. Yeah. I, I think that the existing reliance on V2 that we still have, um, comes from all the legacy systems that we need to access. And one day in the future, which I feel like is a very long time from now, we will roll everything over to fire. I think that is going to happen. Um, it is just so, uh, out of date compared to the other types of technology that we have out here. Um, and, and eventually something's going to come and need to replace fire too. It's just the way things go. Uh, we're going to make improvements to fire and evolve it in, in ways that, you know, require new, uh, systems and new changes. Um, for now though, we're definitely existing in a hybrid world where we have HL7 V2 systems and fire systems, and especially in radiology and in lab, which are two areas that we work in a lot. Um, we're finding that we're doing a lot of hybrid implementations where we connect to the EMR over fire, and then we connect to some interfaces over V2 to the EMR, and then we connect to the uh, LIS, the lab information system over V2, and then we connect to the RIS over V2, and the PAC supports DICOM web, but you know, this other system only supports regular DICOM, and it's really messy right now. Uh, but I think eventually we're going to be moving towards more You sound more adoption. optimistic than I'm picturing it. I, I just, I, technology takes so long to die, but um, uh, yeah. Well, I didn't it, say it, how yeah. long it's going to take, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. You know, maybe maybe when we're both retiring. Exactly, exactly. So how about we close it out with an opportunity for you to just um, I plug your uh, what topology is up to and any other opportunities that you want to let anyone know about? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, I, I mean, the next big conferences that we're going to be at are IHE Connectathon in Toronto. And we're also going to be at HIMSS in Las Vegas uh, in March. Uh, so it'd be great if you, you know, want to say hi, come look us up at one of those shows or one of those events uh, and, and, you know, it'd be great to meet you and chat with you about interoperability. Um, if you do need any kind of work on interoperability, that's where we specialize and that's what we do. Um, so we're working on building tools uh, that are mostly open source for interoperability and supporting the community and being able to adopt and use fire um, and also maintain their legacy V2 standards. <laughs> Magic here, the magic of the scene. Well, thank you it's very much, Alex, and with that said, um... Dicom, HL7, IHE, and the Snap. We're building the future.